And once again, we are here on Living in the 21st Century. Joining me today is Executive Director Andrew Sharp from the Authentic Carbine Foundation. Andrew, welcome to the show. It has been a while. We haven't chatted. <laughs> so um, I know that you have a lot going on with the Carbine Foundation, and you do so much with the Carbine region as well as here in Boston. You have a lot on your hand. But we know we have a virus going on, man, that strangulating everything <laughs> it cut all our it cut all of us plans um for this year things we had planned to do uh, with newton city hall and um your other plans and getting things done we had to stand still so to speak but tell me how how is the carbine right now uh, coping with this and members here in boston dealing with all these activities and you know, you know everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, sure. Errol. It's a pleasure, as usual, yes. to be on your program. Mm -hmm. And um, great work that you're doing um, right here in the diaspora. Yes. Um, since COVID-19, mm -hmm. it has affected the diaspora, mm -hmm. um, Caribbean diaspora, mm -hmm. really, really bad because we have lost people mm -hmm. who, you know, most of our right. diasporans are frontline workers. They work in the tourism industry. So, you know, it's, you know, there has been a lot of deaths from COVID for a lot of Caribbean folks, especially in the major city like New York and Miami. Um, however, you know, we've been coping in terms of adapting to the changes. Um, we see that now um, everything now has gone virtual. So now we're depending on the internet. We're depending on Zoom meetings, webinar meetings, all of that. So we had to um, do some adaptation. Um, also look at taking events virtually. You know, that's what we had to do. Um, we had to readjust some of our festival and take them virtually instead of just postponing them um, till next year um, to see how we're going to be able to cope. Um, because moving forward, I think that we're going to be, um, have to be on a virtual platform um, because this virus seems like it's not leaving us for a while. Well. <laughs> You know, this, and this is the thing that I often worry about. Um, being virtual is fine. It, it has its purpose and it has its place. But the social accumulation of people where other organizations, small businesses, and vendors depend on people interacting with each other, that someone can drop by, buy a drink, buy some food, that's how they make the income. How are these small business people is going to really cope. Now, we can talk all we want on a virtual program, but the actual, you can't feed anyone on a virtual program. You can't spend any money on a virtual program. What kind of impact do you think this is going to have now on small businesses? Should we have to go through this next year? Well, it's having a lot of impact um, on small businesses. Some of them who haven't adjusted have closed. Um, we see also some of our Caribbean folks are not too familiar with the virtual scene. So it's hard on them to adapt, learning how to work the system, how to, um, you know, navigate with sales and, you know, the limitation of, um, of in-house dining for restaurants has been limited and, um, now they have to look at ways how they market themselves right. on a virtual platform. Um, the good point about it is that here in Massachusetts, our governor was able to provide support for some of the small business. And is for these Caribbean American businesses to access the funding that is available. And um, we see that some of them um, there was a lot of people who were not able to get the PPP um, loan that was given by the federal government. 
but our state has been able to put forth small business grants and loans. Um, some of these loans are forgiven, um, but we see the governor just announced a large amount of money for cities to provide to small business persons to help them um, to cushion themselves in the winter period. Um, also, we see that trauma and um, mental health has um, increased. Um, it, a lot of people are in shock how to cope with this whole entire change, new, new, new process. Um, the kids were affected, so how are you going to cope doing business at home with your family there also? <laughs> so. Well, this is not a problem too, because what I've learned and what I've heard is that domestic violence is expeditiously on the rise. And we can imagine what's really going on there in just um, violence as in violence, but you having parents um, sexually molesting their kids. Um, mm -hmm. th there's no way to, there's no place to go, no place to run. Right. You are enclosing some with predators. Right. And with that predatorial behavior, after this virus is done and over, I hope it do, what kind of a society then we're going to have, not that this isn't going on, this activity is not going on all along. Right. But then what are we going to do with these people who had, who had been subjected to this kind of trauma while they were enclosed behind doors and no place to run? Cops don't want to show up at your place. I mean, if they have to come, they, they have to come. But coming to your homes, they're at risk also. So how are we going to actually... It, it puts a blanket um, there for criminals to hide behind and actually do things and get away with it. Is, is there anything you would want to say in terms of encouraging those parents or children to come forward and speak their minds? Well, yes, definitely. We have been fortunate in that we have been busy. Right. Because, you know, as a foundation, um, it's important that we provide for the community. Right. So we had a very good uh, summer where we were able to access grants. We were able to provide for the kids a back to school. We did a back, back to school drive where we were able to support some of the families with their kids with material, although they're not going into the physical school, but then they're able to have um, reading books, exercise book to do their work at, at, um, at home. Um, we came up with some ideas of uh, after school program that will fit the family scenario where we'll take off the tension of, of the child being, you know, consistently on Zoom trying to learn and also to, to, to bridge that family experience where they could sit down and enjoy after school program which is um, fit into folklore and story time that they can learn their um, Caribbean American heritage. Um, so that's what some of the stuff that we've done. We also saw other foundation and we have partnered with other foundation in terms of giving um, food for people who are in need because that was one thing that people were worrying about. When you have a pandemic, food security is a big issue. Um, you know, a lot of people got laid off from the job. We're going to get money to purchase food and so forth. So we were able to um, provide support in terms of advising people where to go to the food bank to get, um, you know, meal. There were some people who have never been to a food bank before, but the pandemic has caused right. a lot of people to go now yeah. to the food bank. Well, I think too, one of the things that I was hearing is that most of these kids who rely on going to school and getting a meal, because they are not subjected to be home, um, there's no longer that meal to look forward to. Now it's a little bit more burdenous on the parents to provide them that meal. Now, unfortunately, some of these parents would have lose their jobs, which make it much harder. Yes. And even those who have their jobs, their income and raise, some of them was for load. Some of them had, probably had 
um, salary or wages cuts based on this pandemic. Uh, what, what hindrances do you see that would prohibit these children from mentally, um, from being mentally stable? One of the things too, we found that some of the kids them, it's hard for them to adapt to the technology. Mm -hmm. So how to use the system um, to concentrate because now they're at home. Mm -hmm. So that environment is different. Um, also, what has been good is that some of the schools decided to provide lunches for the parents, for these kids. So the parents would have to go and collect them from a designated um, area mm -hmm. um, for the kids. So, you know, it has its ups and downs, but um, what we found to a lot of the, there are some kids that are, you know, really not able to adapt to the, to the um, online training, because the, the, some of them is more focused on, um, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, then also you have the special needs kids that you have to look um, about also, where they're gonna need attention and um, assistance. So, you know, it's really, it's really, this COVID has really, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it really caused a mess. Um, you, even going back there too, um, I know that you were putting together materials, whether it's clothing, um, other products and posting to the Caribbean um, to help out with some of those children who are badly in need. Um, with the virus so rampant now, you don't know who clothes <laughs> is contaminating. Yes. What is, did, is this still active or do you put that on hold during this period of time? Well, what we, what we did was do an assessment. And um, one of the things that, you know, that we have <coughs> been um, working with the embassies and the Caribbean region was to get an update on what's been happening in the region, what they really need. And we found that what is really needed was food items. So um, we did a food drive mm -hmm. in terms of, and then we were able also to send back to school supplies to the Caribbean because in the Caribbean, some of the schools are open. Right. Yeah, and the numbers are not that high like the United States. So we were able to supply those kind of backpack, but we, we draw back on the clothes item and more focus more on canned goods and, 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 you know, food stuff that they would require and then also provide the back to school supplies that the kids would need. So books and, um, you know, reading books, exercise book, pencil, mm -hmm. those kind of things that they will definitely need in the long term run. Um, also, we see that there was a demand for tablets and, um, that was something that um, we looked at, but we haven't taken it on fully because one of the things in the region too is the access to the internet. Right. It's not like here, and even here too, there's some, some household that don't have access to internet. So there it's been an issue where the access to the internet, one, this, the service, and two is the cost. And some parents just cannot afford yeah, the cost true. of um, paying for the internet. And also to, to, to configure the, right. the computer to, to the system. So we just kept um, focus on um, providing support too, because even here, we had a lot of students who needed counseling um, how to adapt. We had a situation when the virus came in where, you know, they, a lot of um, international mm -hmm. students were, you know, they had to leave their colleges. They had to leave where they were staying. And they didn't even know how they were going to get support, how they were going right. to figure out how to navigate the system, 
also their immigration status with the, this mm -hmm. administration. So we were we were busy doing a lot wow. of, you know. Well, I, I can imagine. But <laughs> well, I'm glad you touched also on this. Um, and just, I want to divert into that for a, a few minutes or so. The immigration aspect of things. Now, there are those, even though they are straight in this country, who have the immigrant papers, legal, clean, that are leaving and going to their home countries, whether it's to spend a vacation or visit, whatever vacation, the um, occasion may be. And when they get to the borders to come back into their country, really, which is here in the United States, they are not getting, um, they're not permit to come back in. Hence, they have to look now at getting an attorney to get them sorted out to be back in this country. Why do you think that is going on? <laughs> well, um, you know, each country has their own administration, mm -hmm. and this administration has been very strict on mm -hmm. the immigration process. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Two, there is a pandemic, mm -hmm. so also there is a preca um, precaution on um, you know, the virus being spreading, not just only for the United mm -hmm. States, but also for the Caribbean region. Mm -hmm. So there were two instances that you're going back home and you're being quarantined and being looked at. Right. And then another instance is that you're trying to get back here and being, <laughs> you know. Well, um, well I, I agree there, there are moments. As a matter of fact, I think when you come here to Massachusetts, you have to quarantine for at least, I think, 14 days. Yeah. And that's it. But what I'm talking about, even long before this pandemic had occurred, um, Trump was on this immigration policy. It was so stringent is that even though, I know of a person actually from Indianapolis who were living in this country 25 years and they are clean, they are straight. <laughs> and they went to Barbados and on their way back in, they were stopped. They, 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 they got deported back to Barbados. Then they had to find an attorney to get this stuff to do. So um, that, that is on that part. I don't understand what the administration presently is doing. Um, the, as long as the immigrant, whether you are a legal immigrant or a legal immigrant, in some cases it doesn't make a difference. They do what they want to do. Um, and that's the reality on that. But moreover, I want to look at tourism. And we know tourism in the Caribbean is, is solely dependent on people traveling from the US, Canada, Europe, Germany, you name it, uh, from people from all around the world. And this virus, I believe, would have dealt a blow at a very expeditious rate. They weren't looking for it. And because they are deprived now from tourists coming to the country and they're not making that income that they normally used to make, people were laid off, jobs are just like here, um, people going on more unemployment than ever, and it's really hurting the Caribbean region. How would, in your opinion, how would um, the Caribbean governments look to remedy a situation like that when their main source of income is put to the test, so to speak. Do you think there's any way they can um, try to be more independent within their micro environment internally in their countries rather than dependent on tourism? What do you think may happen there? Great point. Um, the region has been devastated mm -hmm. by the virus and the mm -hmm reduction of um, tourism arrival, which right. is one of the main earners for, mm -hmm. for about 85% of the Caribbean right. islands. Um, at a discussion that we had with the ambassador and the tourism mm -hmm. um, directors mm -hmm. and, in the min and some of the ministries, um, official from the tourism department, mm -hmm. um, it was discussed and outlined the effect that the virus has had mm -hmm. um, one of the things too is the cruise ship mm -hmm. arrivals right. they ain't coming back for now mm -hmm. due to the restriction that yes. the CDC has mm -hmm. placed on them mm -hmm. also the quarantine 
um, was an issue where people were coming in and it has to be tested and you don't know who is coming in with the virus, right. um, which will affect some of the Caribbean islands haven't opened up to tourism as yet, to visitors, international visitors. So during the discussion, and um, what was discussed is, it's now time that the region diversify the tourism product mm -hmm. and also look at other industries mm -hmm. that can provide um, support mm -hmm. for the region. Mm -hmm. And another thing too that was discussed is the effort in terms of interregional travel. So traveling within the Caribbean by Caribbean nationals mm -hmm. instead of um, right. international, mm -hmm. because international is not gonna come back like how it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the focus. Um, also it was discussed that um, we need to look at agro agro tourism, mm -hmm. um, look at the industries, the creative industries, um, as another source of income for the Caribbean region, um, than being just dependent on right. sun, sand, and sea. Right. <laughs> well, I, absolutely, I like the concept of dependent on uh, agro tourism and um, agriculture, but I found. Um, when it comes to the external market, when in terms of agriculture, there are limited amounts um, or rations, so to speak, on how much the Caribbean has their quota. Um, Caribbean territories have their quota and what they can export, and that's it. As a matter of fact, that's how they're making, actually, their secondary income beside tourism, or in some cases, their primary income. But with that limitation, put to the test, even if they go over and look at it, it's either they have to come up with other agricultural products, they may look at having to go into a canning industry where they can preserve their products and try to sell it, uh, we have more shelf life and try to sell right. it to the external market. Um, but that is good, but a country like Barbados, which I came from, um, it leaves me to wonder, we doesn't have an industry, so to speak, we talk about pride, an industry. And the reality is that Barbados doesn't have an industry for the exception of the tourist industry. The sugar cane industry, which they, they made and manufacture sugar, is a drop in the bucket. When they export their quota when the year come, that's it. Um, at one point their quota was limited because um, they couldn't even make the expectation requirement in terms of supplying the world market. But this is a country that solely depends on tourism. And yeah, there may be news and other services and, and, and trying to make money and makeup and so forth. But with that kind of impact, a, a direct cut off of tourism, so to speak, how would that really affect crime in the country? Because there's no money coming in, there's no jobs. You got the young people. This is going to create now a jungle with the prey and the beast. <laughs> someone is going to prey on someone. <laughs> what, what, you think, what you think in this case is going to happen in terms of crime rate? Do you think they even skyrocket through the roof, more murderers? More, what, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, the region has been affected by um, the crime. Mm -hmm. One of the things that... Um, must be looked at is youth's program. We have to look at how to address programs for the youths. Mm -hmm. Again, the creative industry is there. Mm -hmm. I mean, technology mm -hmm. it has not stopped and we have now moved on mm -hmm. to technology now during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So to be able to, to um, divert some of those youths training mm -hmm. and youths program to technology, mm -hmm. getting them involved to become the next Google inventor right. or, uh, or the app, creative, creative app or so forth is, is important mm -hmm. um, that um, the region must look at. Look at. Um, also, we have the sea, the blue economy. Um, we have never explored the blue economy. Mm -hmm. um, a country like Barbados that is surrounded by the, mm -hmm. you have the Atlantic Sea mm -hmm. and you have the Caribbean Sea. 
<laughs> you know, there is so many exploration in terms of the blue economy. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to, years ago, I used to often wonder, um, when I was younger, I often wonder if America had beaches or if Canada had beaches or Germany, those countries, right? <laughs> and to be quite honest with you, I see a lot of beautiful beaches here in America that Barbados can't even compare with. But we grew up in school, was, we were thought that we got the land and the sea and the beautiful beaches and we were excited about it, let's sell that. And that's no, that's, that is no a dream, right? You can go to Carolinas, you can go here on Cape Cod, you can find beautiful beaches where a tourist doesn't have to leave and come to your country to enjoy the benefits. And if you ask me, it's even far much beautiful. But this is not to say that Barbie is beautiful. The beauty, the difference between the ocean here and the ocean there is that you've got warm waters. <laughs> you can be mm -hmm. in nice warm, warm waters. Well, here you can be you can be bathing in some icy waters even when it's summer. Right. So that's a consolation to the Caribbean region. But I think the time had arrived where the Caribbean territories just can't see themselves as just a beach and sea, and that's what we want to sell to the world. Um, the world had matured, and they know they know what um, beautiful sceneries are like. And if they have to compare some of the Caribbean nations to where they come from, they're far more excitement. So I would love if the Caribbean region can reframe a little, not really reframe from marketing themselves as beautiful beaches and sea and so forth. That's good, and I encourage them to do that. But they can't solely rely on the fact that we have these things to offer when other major countries has the same product. I think from my standpoint, what the Caribbean nation have to look at as their intellects, the strongest resources that the Caribbean yes. region have is their academic excellence. Yes. Superior to the world. And the world acknowledges that. Yes. And I think what <clears throat> they should take a page out of America's book. Every college, every university they try to sell um, their education, market their education. Come on. Some nation in the Caribbean needs to step up and have the first Caribbean State University right. and exploit that region and, and even beyond that region to bring income that can best serve their country, whether it's through dormitoriums, through the, the courses that they sell. And we've got excellent professors and teachers there, some of the best. It's just that they're in, a small, they're in small countries. But I believe that if they can sit down and start marketing and selling the, the academic excellence that they will do wonders, I think the Caribbean need the first state university hospitals that they can train and recruit doctors for the other Caribbean regions. Um, but everybody wants to come to America and go to Harvard, everybody wants to go to England, go to Oxford, and, and these kind of things. But they are not seeing the wealth within themselves. And because of this, they're missing the mark. They're not understanding, they don't have industry to that level. But the greatest industry they have is the academic excellence. Mm -hmm. Sell that, market that. And they can become a very competitive um, place in the world. I'm sure there's students here who don't want to be caught in their dorms every winter. They want to go to the Caribbean region right. where they have all year sun and they can visit the same beaches and bathe in warm water and go nice um, places and enjoy um, themselves and so forth. So, so, so yes, Andrew. So, um, so the reality, I think the Caribbean region has a lot to offer. But it's, they must start looking in the right direction um, within themselves and start looking at the power they have in their mind as great ac academic achievers. Yes. Sell that to the world. Absolutely. But yeah, so um, we're going to take a break here and we will come back with the second half of Living in the 21st Century. Thank you.